Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Marco. Uh, I'm a designer on Android. Uh, I lead the design team that works on Google Play and uh, the core Android applications. Uh, and I'm Kirill. I'm a UI engineer on the uh, Google Play team, uh, working mostly on the Store app. Right. So today we're going to be talking about Google Play. Um, let's see how many people use Google Play here, just to make sure that everybody knows what it is. How many people use at least one application in Google Play? Great. How many people use at least two applications on Google Play? Three applications? The whole suite? Great. We have some, some fans. So for, any, for anyone who didn't raise their hand, uh, Google Play is basically, in practice, six applications which define the media offering uh, from Google. It's the store where you purchase content, and it is a set of applications where you enjoy the content you purchased or you got for free, like books, music, movies, uh, magazines and news, and games. Today, we're going to talk to you about a journey that our team took about a year ago when we redesigned the Play suite of applications. Um, we think this is a very interesting journey because it talks about some of the principles that we've shown uh, last, uh, the other day, yesterday, during the keynote, which is the one adapted design. Our experience was basically around thinking about a system that could scale across all devices and that could be consistently perceived as one suite, as one family of applications, uh, where iconography, colors, uh, how the content is displayed, interaction was defined once to scale across all devices and different platforms. This is how it should feel. Uh, it is multiple devices, and, it's, and, and in a sense, their, the UI is scaling across them in a very consistent and familiar way, where the interaction doesn't change and where the user is not surprised. There are problems that we face today where the experience is almost more important to be defined across all devices to be consistent rather than very specific, specific for web versus iOS versus Android, because we see users scaling and moving across all devices in a very fluid way. So this was Play uh, in 2012. As you can see, there were a set of applications not very consistent with one another. And if you went to the web, we had even yet another mental model, another look and feel, and another approach to interaction. The issues, in essence, were the design wasn't consistent, the design didn't scale, and one size couldn't fit all of our users. Design was a consistent, in essence, you see that even the same content, like albums, will be represented differently from web to devices to the store. We just had a lot of interaction models. Design that didn't scale because we had different design for web and devices, we ended up having to design the same feature multiple times. And this was you know, taking a lot of time from design side where we had to be thinking about the same feature, but how it would behave and be uh, implemented from an interaction design perspective and visual design perspective on web versus devices. And one size couldn't, couldn't fit all because we, 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 we essentially we didn't have a way to display content dynamically, especially on the store. We had to draw tiles manually. Uh, to recommend content to our users, but we couldn't generate content in a dynamic way to suggest content that was really personalized to people because there wasn't a way to display it. So our goals uh, that we set up for this project were to create consistency across play applications, to have efficient layouts across device and web, and to be able to populate our content dynamically. So where did we start? We actually didn't start by thinking about grids, and we didn't start thinking about the spaces where the information would live. We rather started thinking about the modules that we would use to fill up our spaces. So what was our key component? Our key component was a card back then, uh, as today Google was embracing this metaphor, and it felt for us that if content is what we display most of the time in our Play applications, a car felt like a very good common denominator to display these types of objects. It would be good to display applications, to display albums and movies and magazines and books, even people or places, you name it. 
It was a very good way to display objects and to sort of have this common denominator that could make these interactions across objects consistent. The way you would remove objects, the way you would add objects, the way you would do actions with objects could be consistent no matter what these objects were and no matter where they lived. The second item, the second structural item that we thought about were the canvases, which essentially are where these objects live. A canvas is just a space. In the holy grail of Google is the color E5, 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 which lives in many different places of our applications. What we did, we started defining our space divided in columns so that the content could be displayed in a similar fashion and across a grid that was defined to scale across multiple devices width. So the more the device was large, the more content we could display. And you could have less or more content, it could be reordered. The content was basically leaving object into these canvases. It could change according to context, it could be grouped in clusters as I'll show you later or into this big, big long list or big long grids, uh, like in a search result. It could be content like movies, it could be content like people. We have this view in our Play Games application. And a canvas didn't have to be necessarily a gray background. A canvas is essentially anything that is living underneath. In Play Movies, if you played with this application, we have an awesome feature where basically when you pause the movie, we identify who the actor is, we also identify if there's a song playing in the background, and we tell the user, so here we identify the actor. And you see, we show a person's card, and we show a bunch of movies where, the, uh, where this actor had been participating, and we do it in the same consistent way. The movie playing is just a canvas where our content is displayed dynamically. We do the same thing in books. When we select a word and this word is a location, we identify that being a location and we show the location card. Even here, the canvas is content. A third item in our list were sizes. Obviously, um, a size that looks, uh, uh, a card that looks of a certain size on a phone, the same size will be perceived smaller on bigger screens simply because the larger the canvas, the, 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 size, the, the, the more the size will perceive small uh, versus the same size being used on a smaller screen. Uh, so this is a tiny card which we use on phone, which turns into a small card which we use on tablets. And we started defining a bunch of other different cards because you know, layouts need to adapt, uh, the cards need to adapt to different layouts that need different characteristics, uh, like list views. We also defined sizes because we needed hierarchy as well. Um, when we recommend content, we like to say, this is very special for you, we make it very big. And we like to say, these are maybe other things you may be interested about, this could be smaller. So sizes are super important, and again, while the sizes change, the interaction doesn't change. We always have those overflow menus on those cards, we always have the same way we represent this content. You should almost feel like the content is this card which is expanding and moving and twisting around, but it doesn't change, it's the same card, even in a list view. Another item were the clusters. So, for the psychology of perception, when I have multiple items next to one another, obviously they will perceive as a group. And groups are important to define areas where the user should interact, or also collections. And you see here where the hierarchy is preserved when we have big items and smaller items. And you can also see that when we define these sizes, we made sure they were part of the same modular system so they could be plugged into one another. We also made sure that these sizes would make sense across all the devices we have. They would make sense on phones. They would make sense on seven inch tablets or 10 inch tablets and beyond, including the web. Let's talk about interaction now. <clears throat> we have websites, we have touch screen devices. We think that the interaction should be consistent. The user shouldn't feel lost when it goes between you know, an Android device to an iOS device to the web. Obviously, the web has a different type of interaction because you use a mouse most of the time. Uh, but the pattern can be still consistent. So we use a side navigation, uh, which is hidden on devices. You need, to, you need to tap on what people call the hamburger menu. But on web, we actually leave it exposed because we have more space. 
Also, you see that the, the navigation menu provides the same type of information. However, we did make some differences uh, to make sure that all the different form factors could uh, be the most efficient as possible. So you see here, playlist is exposed as a single destination on devices to the right, while on the left, on web, the playlists are exposed in the sun navigation itself, so the user can drag content into it, and we can facilitate a faster interaction. Nevertheless, the positions where you find your content, where you navigate, is consistent across web and devices here. Let's look at another example, the tabs. Um, if you're an Android user, you know that uh, we have swipey tabs, so you can swipe from one another. This doesn't happen on the web. It would be very difficult to swipe with the mouse. But still, we have the same information being displayed. In this example, to the right, or to my left, <laughs> uh, I'm swiping to see um, genres on touchscreen devices. On the web, I need to select a particular item and see a drop-down list. So the interaction is slightly different, but again, the user will not feel lost because the positioning of those elements is consistent. We have menu buttons. Uh, on the web, we expose them on rollover. Uh, this is the play music experience on the web. While on devices, we expose menu buttons at the single car level uh, because you know, we don't have rollover, obviously. Uh, on iOS, we have panels that slide from the bottom because this is the typical iOS pattern and we want to make people feel at ease when they use our applications. On Android, we use uh, pop-ups because this is how Android does. Again, the interaction is the same. The expressions of this, of this interaction may change slightly between different platforms. So let's look at the outcome. These were our suite of applications, these are our suite of applications today. Um, you see that the layouts feel more consistent. We have uh, the, the, the menu item on top of every card. The, everything is the same mental model. You also can perceive how we introduced a strong brand that we didn't have before, which is uh, communicating through the use of strong colors. This is also another element that we're pushing through the material design this year across more applications. And the user, when, when faces um, play applications, should feel this is different. This is a part of the same family. This is true for devices. This is true for web. Our layouts, uh, we think, are pretty responsive. Uh, you see in this example how um, the same structure is contained across multiple devices. Here I'm recommended the Batman movie because a friend of mine uh, plus one it. And the Batman movie is larger on devices like phones or tablets, but obviously on tablets the car becomes much bigger because we want to, contain, we want to maintain the hierarchy on larger devices and we need to make that car to be louder than we, what we would do on devices like phones on smaller screens. Uh, it is modular and it tries to adapt to the user. You see here the system is slightly moving the face of, of this author in order to be displayed across smaller screens. Obviously we have more space on tablets, but again, it is all responsive and the type of display, the type of experience you have is pretty much the same. Uh, it is familiar. Um, these two are different applications. The one to my right is the Playbooks application. The other one is the store. But navigating between two APKs doesn't have to feel like a very different experience. You have ways to still make your code efficient and build different applications and still make the experience to be fluid when the, when the user is navigating between one application to another. We know we have people going between consumption to purchase as use cases very often. And it is familiar when you face new play applications. Maybe you were a play music user. You want to see how the, play, the playbook applications work. We think that you're going to be welcomed by a very similar interface and you're going to be feeling at home. Um, it is responsive. Obviously, when you have a larger space, you get more content to be displayed. This is an example that I particularly like, where you see that uh, on my right, um, we have a big car that wouldn't fit on a landscape layout. So even here, we maintain the hierarchy, but the car sort of adjusts itself to display the content to the right. 
Again, you should really feel that as I'm stretching my windows on, uh, on, on, a, on a web browser, as I'm changing my device, almost if magically the screen was changing in sizes, all my, cars are all my cards are responsive, they change in size, they try to adapt to whatever the form factor is. Uh, it works cross-platform. Um, it works on web, it works on Android. Uh, we recently introduced also a mobile web UI, which compared to what we do on Android, feels pretty much the same experience. It works on iOS, uh, like I've mentioned before. These are the play, movie, the play music application compared between the two different platforms. And now I'm going to give the controller to Kirill. He's going to teach you some coding tricks and he's going to talk more about some of these principles. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. So what Marco talked about is this uh, system that I would say is uh, pretty efficient and flexible in presenting uh, c uh, collections. So if you talk about uh, what we call a landing page of the store where we want to show you multiple collections or items, top charts, my library in the music, um, or uh, search results uh, in uh, various applications. And uh, we wanted to extend this uh, consistency and uh, flexibility into uh, additional parts of, uh, into additional places where the users interact with our uh, applications. So the first one is a uh, side drawer or navigation drawer that was introduced a year ago at I.O. And we've been slowly migrating, a uh, little bit too slowly if you will, uh, we've been migrating our play apps uh, to use the side drawer. And uh, we do want to see it, at least in the play suite of apps, as this what we call primary destinations. We don't want to overload it with like, you know, you start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. We want to have something like four, five, or maybe six primary destinations within each app. And then uh, we also put this uh, kind of secondary action settings, help, and um, uh, feedback. And uh, what happens here is that once you know that you can swipe to the left, or a, a kind of a tap that uh, hamburger icon and uh, see this uh, navigation, you will apply that knowledge, you will be at ease across multiple apps, across pretty much all apps in the Play Suite. From the technical implementation, we use uh, the support library. Uh, drawer layout itself is um, kind of the uh, implementation of uh, kind of that allows you to slide the thing uh, from the left or from the right on RTL layouts uh, and uh, for uh, integration with the action bar, the action bar drawer toggle. And we use a consistent typography, iconography, and colors once again to kind of enforce this consistency. But what this is talking about like the technical implementation details, but what is more important is that we do want to create this consistent navigation model across all our applications to put the user at ease whenever he is on Android or on iOS device or on the web. Swipey tabs, uh, we use it uh, in conjunction uh, with the view pager. Uh, sometimes we do want to kind of present this um, multi-tab experience. Uh, on the left, uh, if you go from left to right, is uh, different views into your music collection in the Play Music app than uh, a single game in the play games, just different parts of uh, kind of uh, the information that we want to present. And the two last ones are uh, various uh, collections in the play uh, store app. So what we want to have here is we want to have this multi-tab experience. And uh, we use ViewPager from the support library that provides a very nice consistent way that you can swipe left and right between uh, the tabs. And uh, we have uh, uh, our own custom implementation of uh, the tab strip that you can uh, swipe left and right independently of the tabs themselves. And we have this uh, two-way kind of binding uh, that uh, to keep in sync, to keep the selection of the uh, view pager itself and uh, the uh, tab strip uh, in sync. Once again, a little bit of technical details, but what is most important is that once the user knows that he can swipe left and right, he or she can swipe left and right, the tab, it's, uh, the tab strip itself, that knowledge can be directly applied to other uh, offerings from our uh, play suite of apps. And uh, this is what happens, I think it's a nice touch. Uh, if you go from left to right, uh, you uh, switch from the about tab to the uh, My Achievements tab. And in addition to the content itself kind of sliding from left to right, you can also see in the uh, title strip the thick uh, green underline which uh, kind of signifies 
uh, the currently selected tab, it also slides, instead of jumping immediately, it kind of slides to the newly selected tab and it also shrinks or expands based on uh, relative widths of these uh, two tabs. And uh, these are a little bit of technical details. On every scroll event, we compute uh, the starting X position and the width of this uh, underline, and uh, we call uh, invalidate on the title strip. And then in on draw, we uh, draw that uh, green rectangle or however, whichever color is needed for that specific uh, content type. Once again, we want to be consistent across our multiple apps and to kind of enhance and uh, uh, enforce this consistency. Hero images are, I would say, a very big part of material design. I think Marco will agree with me. It's a very visually rich and attractive way, if the images look good, of course. Um, it's a very attractive way to uh, frame your content, to uh, position your content. And uh, they would usually go, I would say, uh, they pretty much have to go at the top of, the, uh, at the top of your content. In uh, this uh, sequence of screenshots from left to right, you see an album page in the Play Music app, a movie page in Play Movies, a game page in Play Games, and an article in Play Newsstand. And here, a couple more screenshots from uh, various places in the Play Store app. Uh, Matthias's profile, uh, artist page, TV show page, and what we call an editorial collection. So what you see here is this hero image that goes edge to edge horizontally and also kind of goes into the action bar. So what we want to do with this action bar is instead of this solid block of color that kind of hangs on top of your content and is kind of a little bit distracting, what we do here is we extend the hero image into the action bar. We effectively remove the action bar background while still showing the action bar title and your uh, navigation icons or our uh, action bar icons. Uh, from the implementation point of view, you request this window feature and you call drawable set alpha on your action bar background drawable and that's it. The hero image or effectively your content will extend into the action bar and that hero image uh, you should uh, you should make it uh, not have like you know black bars on top and uh, on bottom because that would look kind of uh, ugly. And uh, if you have these attractive images, it's going to be uh, a very uh, nice experience, not only cross play, but you can see how it informed the uh, specific part of the material design. And uh, in these particular examples, all the images that I've shown were kind of dark, which provided a nice contrast uh, to the uh, white. Um, uh, title and the white uh, icons, but you do want uh, to uh, create kind of black trans translucent black protection, translucent gradient uh, atop, uh, uh, along the top edge of your hero image, so that if your hero image is light, you still have enough uh, contrast to show uh, those kind of foreground elements on your action bar. Once you do start scrolling it, uh, we do it consistently cross play. And uh, I'm uh, pretty sure that uh, it uh, uh, applies uh, well uh, beyond play once you start using hero images in your applications. Once you do start scrolling and you kind of have these, uh, like, you know, individual uh, items, texts, and uh, maybe check marks, check boxes, spinners, kind of scrolling below the action bar, uh, you should make it opaque. You should uh, kind of cross-faded to fully opaque. Otherwise, there's too much noise when, uh, like, you know, text is scrolling behind uh, text. And uh, from the implementation perspective, you uh, register a scroll listener on uh, your main container. It can be list view, scroll view, recycler view, or uh, if you have a custom container, you do that. Uh, you compute the alpha of the uh, action bar background drawable based on uh, how far you've scrolled and how tall the image is. And you call set alpha. Another nice touch is applied consistently across uh, all play applications, once again to kind of enforce this feeling that it's, uh, that we are all part of this bigger suite of applications, is parallax scrolling, which also extended into the material design uh, into this, uh, what we call the Z axis, where you have one or two elements on the screen that feel that they belong, uh, that they are positioned a little bit farther away from you or a little bit closer to you. So what happens if you look at my face over there and uh, this uh, stone arc, 
from left to right as I start scrolling, the vertical alignment of these two images is a little bit uh, different from, uh, from frame to frame. So what happens is that we make the hero image scroll a little bit slower than the rest of the content. Specifically across play applications, we do it at half the rate, just to be consistent across, once again, across all our offerings. But this is not like, you know, this is not like, you know, like something set in stone. You can experiment with uh, different values. It just gives uh, a little bit uh, more interest uh, to, uh, it adds kind of a little bit more flair to what happens when you start scrolling this content. In the same uh, scroll listener that you have uh, in your, uh, in your kind of, in this screen, in your fragment, in your activity, what you do is, or what we do, is for, let's say, you scrolled it up by 200 pixels. What we do, the hero image itself, of course, is scrolled as part of this main uh, column, and we push it down by 100 pixels. So what happens is that while the rest of the content is scrolling at a certain speed, the hero image is scrolling, or appears to be scrolling at half that speed. It appears to be a little bit farther away from you, creating this kind of Z offset, that it appears to be somewhere there in the background, while the main content here is uh, kind of closer to me. We also have this uh, interaction with, uh, he between hero images and the side drawer. We strongly feel that side drawer should be um, this uh, kind of place where you navigate between primary destinations in your app. And so when you, when you open a side drawer, we want to kind of de-emphasize the rest of the content. We want to kind of push it away uh, a little bit uh, away from you. You get it for free from the side drawer with this uh, kind of translucent black overlay that you can see that there's kind of a shade uh, drawn on top of the uh, main content. In addition to that, we also crossfade the action bar to fully opaque. So what happens here is you can see that the hero image kind of goes even farther away from you and uh, the content also appears to kind of be pushed away from you and the uh, drawer kind of moves, uh, moves a little bit closer to you. Once again, we want to be consistent across all Play apps, and uh, this is what we do. This is a specific example in the Play Store, but we, use, uh, but we do it everywhere in the Play apps. And a little bit of the technical details. Um, on every slide event, we compute the alpha of the uh, background drawable of the action bar based on how far along you are in this uh, sliding motion and how far vertically you are in your column of content. And uh, now back to Marco. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's recap what we, what we saw and what we learned from it. This was the state of play in uh, 2012. A lot of different applications, different among themselves, different in the way they were working on web versus Android devices. Our goals were to create consistency, to have efficiency in the way we design our layouts and we implement them and to be able to display content dynamically. This is where we ended up, or this is where we ended up until today. Um, we have work going on and a lot of things coming, of course. Um, but you can see what we achieved was to create a consistency and a strong brand, what we believe being a strong brand that differentiated our applications from other applications out there. Um, they work across web with mobile, mobile versions, with the full uh, dynamic population of content. We have the same layouts working on iOS, respecting the iOS pattern, but also bringing the Google Touch and the Google Play Touch. And that's what we think, how we think people should perceive our content. It's just about content, it's about color, it's about photography. It doesn't matter which device you're using. What were the results? Um, certainly we increased the speed of execution. Before we were spending a lot of time in getting the same features in different applications on between web and devices, while at this point we are very fast in defining how things should work and make them work everywhere. Obviously when you support more platform, you need more developers. But we didn't increase largely the number of designers, even if we started having applications on iOS and other platforms that we didn't support before. 
And we also saw more collaboration among designers. We can have more people focusing on a problem and tackling it and doing it very well, like introducing a new pattern and scaling across all applications, rather than having a lot of designers working in their own desk to solve a little problem for the little small uh, application. So what is next? Uh, so we have uh, four additional sessions that I would recommend you uh, if you're interested in uh, seeing where we're going with material design. And uh, specifically at 11 o'clock, I know we uh, don't usually talk about um, what's uh, next in the pipeline, but if you do want to see what uh, Marco's team is doing, exploring, bringing Google Play further into the material world, if you had to select one session, go um, to the 11 o'clock session in this room. I really highly recommend it. I'm not going to say anything uh, more beyond that. And uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, so uh, we have uh, the Android design guidelines available at uh, this uh, URL. And in addition, yesterday we've uh, published a kind of cross Google or material design guidelines at google.com slash design. Uh, your feedback is uh, highly appreciated. This QR code or this uh, short link and uh, Additional sessions from this year's I.O. and uh, previous year's uh, conferences is available on the Google Developers Channel. And uh, here we would like to thank you for your time today. Uh, you can find us on Google+. And thank you for your time. Thank and you. uh, we have uh, 12 minutes, 34 seconds uh, for questions. There are two mics over here in left and right. Thank you once again. Questions? No questions? Uh, do you want to go to the mic? Uh, hello, uh, Mehmet from Chicago Content Direct. I have a question about the side drawer menu. Um, what do you think about categorized side drawer menus? Uh, from your design, you have uh, each menu element on its own but some of the apps use a more categorized approach where they say this, these are your home side menus and these are your, let's say, different playlists under a playlist tab. Mm -hmm. So they are more categorized. What, what do you think about this approach? Um, can I take this question? Yeah. I don't think there's one rule to fit them all. Uh, on Play specifically, we decided to only expose the main areas there are other applications that uh, expose a more granular list. Uh, I think it's important with, if you have a series of applications to be consistent within yourselves. So, you know, if we had one play application going one way, another play application going another way, that probably would be confusing. But I, there isn't really a rule for what to put in the sign nav in terms of destination. There is a rule which is we should try not to put actions in the sign nav. We should respect uh, the overflow menu and the actions being exposed in the action bar or in the view in itself and use the side nav purely for destinations. But whether the destination is a singular playlist or it is the whole playlist area as a whole, uh, there isn't really a special rule. I think it's up to the designer and to the developer uh, to define based on their experience. Thank you. Yeah, and you don't want to end up with what uh, happened in uh, like in the late 90s in desktop applications when they kind of had this tools menu which just threw random items that didn't have any connection with each other because there was no better place, if you will, to uh, throw them. So the side drawer is not supposed to be a junk drawer. Yeah, something you can do is also create hierarchy. As you see in our side navigation, we try to create some hierarchy between settings and send feedback and things like that versus the main destinations which we try to highlight more. Yeah, with typography and like sizing. Since we're talking side drawers, I've seen a couple of usability studies that say there's about a 50% drop off in discoverability of the side drawer menu items versus tabs. Do you have any experience or additional data points in that area? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I definitely agree with that. And uh, I don't think it's new. I don't think you need uh, a genius to write those sort of articles because clearly if you hide items inside a button, you're going to have less uh, engagement than if those items were exposed. This is also true if you have actions in the overflow menu, rather than being exposed, they will have less engagement. So 
Obviously, yes, this is a new risk tech. Uh, if you see the way we tackle this on our applications, is that the sign up, yes, does have all the destinations you can go to, but we also expose most of the time those destinations in the main view. Uh, so, for example, if you're in the store, we do have a people section, but if you have friends, we also expose an explore cluster in your main destination. Or if you see what we do on newsstand, we have introduced a bunch of different tabs for you to read all the different sections you have. And in the sign up, really, what we, what we leave is A, a clear and consistent way to see what we have, despite of what is presented in the, in the main navigation in the main page, but also destinations that we think are uh, less important and they shouldn't have a lot of engagement. So for instance, if you have a destination which is about library management, it's fine to be in the sign up because how many times do you go to a destination to delete an album or to, you know, to do other things with this? But certainly your main experience is where you land and there are ways to connect the dots even in the same main uh, experience without having you to go to the sign navigation. The sign navigation can almost be a tree of all the things that you have within your application. <clears throat> all right, looks like we're done. Okay. If you want to talk to us, we're going to stay here for seven more minutes without Yeah, and we'll be in the, out in the hallway. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.